The Second World War was basically a conflict between two groups of belligerents, the Allies and the Axis. The membership of each group was fluid, with some countries entering the conflict late or even switching sides. In January 1942, 26 countries signed the document by United Nations, and from this point onward the term United Nations, not to be confused with the post-war organization of that name, was used synonymously with the Allies. Wartime propaganda frequently made a point of extolling the concept of the United Nations and the contributions of the various countries to the war effort. Prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent entry of the United States into the war, pop culture often focused on the resistance of Great Britain to the Nazi juggernaut. Beginning in 1942, the other Allied nations were added to the picture. Comic books followed this pattern, with many interior stories lauding the actions of the French, Greeks, Russians, Chinese, Dutch, Yugoslavs, Poles, and others who were offering resistance to Nazi and Japanese aggression. In addition to fictional Allied characters, comic book stories contain cameo appearances by real-life Allied leaders, including President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Marshal Joseph Stalin, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, Free French leader Charles de Gaulle, and various military officers of the United States and other Allied nations. Comic book covers, however, were less likely to feature Allied forces or prominent Allied characters. The reasons for this seem clear. First, comic book covers most often depict scenes of the protagonist fighting against villains and only incidentally might include other sympathetic characters. Additionally, while it was all right to caricature and mock the enemy leaders, portraying them in unflattering ways, it was more difficult to show allies and allied leaders in a dignified manner in comic book cover format. There were, however, a number of exceptions to this rule. Wartime propaganda in the United States did not make heavy use of the image of American President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In addition to the reasons cited above, the relative dearth of Roosevelt references may reflect a belief that the current President of the United States should not be used as a symbol for the American people. Instead, the fictitious Uncle Sam fulfills this role. Although some comic stories utilize President Roosevelt as a character, he appeared on only a handful of comic book covers during the war. All but one of these were on true story comic books, and thus his image was not really exploited for propaganda purposes in the context of a fictional story. The only significant exception is the cover of Mystic Comics No. 4, August 1940, drawn by Alex Schomburg. Superhero Hercules stops a train bearing down on the official car carrying President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Although he isn't explicitly named, the resemblance is clear and the signs carried by the cheering crowd in the background do read, Welcome Mr. President. This cover is non-war oriented. The sinister railroad engineer isn't identified as a Nazi. In fact, a colorist has made him look almost African American. But it may have been thought that depicting the actual President of the United States in peril was in poor taste anyway. In any event, this type of comic book cover was not repeated during the war years. After President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was probably the most prominent Allied leader, since Great Britain had been involved in World War II for over two years before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Churchill's image does appear on several True Story comic book covers, including True Comics No. 1, dated April 1941, where he is identified as World Hero No. 1. He also appears with President Roosevelt and Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek 
on the cover of the May 1942 issue of Real Heroes Comics. Churchill did show up on the cover of several fictional comic books as well. Alex Schomburg included a very small image of Winston Churchill, rather improbably wearing a canary yellow suit, but with his familiar bowler hat and cigar, on the cover of Submariner No. 3, dated Fall 1941. The caption indicates the Prime Minister is christening a warship, apparently based on the flag bunting, built in an American shipyard for British use. The cover of Weird Comics No. 20, dated January 1942, depicts a rather disgruntled-looking Winston Churchill about to be abducted from London by Adolf Hitler himself. The comic cover caption calls him Vornoff for some reason, but it is clearly intended to be Churchill, hat, cigar, and all. The final fictional Winston Churchill cover of the war years was USA Comics No. 5, Summer 1942. Al Gabrielle's art shows the juvenile superhero group The Victory Boys rescuing a dazed-looking Churchill from the Axis World Order meeting, where he's being compelled to sign peace treaties by Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and a generic Japanese caricature. Ironically, the comic book covers featuring Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, extolled in Allied propaganda during the war as one of the big three Allied leaders, all date from the period when Stalin was practically considered a member of the Axis powers. The Soviet Union and Nazi Germany signed a non-aggression pact in August 1939, and from then until late June 1941, the Russians and the Nazis were collaborators particularly in the invasion of Eastern Europe. After Hitler's forces invaded Russia, of course, the Soviets suddenly became valued allies and Stalin changed from villain to hero. Joseph Stalin's unofficial membership in the Axis is depicted on the covers of Startling Comics No. 7, dated May 1941, and Catman Comics Volume 1, No. 8, from July 1941. On the first cover, artist Ken Platt draws Stalin and a nondescript Nazi stereotype in the grasp of the heroic Captain Future. Charles Quinlan's cover for Catman Comics caricatures Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini. One of the most interesting examples of the sudden shift in Stalin's status is the original cover for Young Allies No. 1, dated Summer 1941. A house ad in Human Torch Comics No. 5 shows a sinister Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini with the Red Skull, whose banner proclaims him to be Dictator of America, clashing with Captain America's sidekick Bucky and the Human Torch's juvenile aide Toro. But when the actual issue of The Young Allies No. 1 was published, the cover had been completely redrawn by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, eliminating both Stalin and Mussolini. Curiously, the interior story still features Stalin in an unsympathetic role as he sends the young allies to prison in Siberia. In Allied propaganda, nationalist Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek was elevated to a position of rather more prominence than he played in real life. Despite the characterization of Chiang as a great democratic leader and the valiant commander of a fighting army, the Allies primarily used China as a distraction to tie up Japanese troops. Chang himself appeared only on the covers of non-fiction true story comic books. True Comics No. 3 from August 1941 bills Chang as Chinese hero No. 1. The cover of Real Life Comics No. 5 shows Chang and his well-known wife Madam Chang trampling on the Japanese flag. A handful of other comic book covers did depict fictional Chinese characters, as we shall see shortly. Another wartime leader whose image appeared in Allied propaganda was Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French. In June 1940, aware that the French government was preparing to ask the Nazi invaders of his nation for an armistice, de Gaulle, at the time a general in the French army, escaped to England and assumed leadership of the free French government in exile. 
As with Chiang Kai-shek, de Gaulle was lauded in propaganda as a valuable partner in the war effort, but his actual relationship with the Allies was problematical. The cover of Real Life Comics No. 4 shows de Gaulle with Joan of Arc, a comparison the French general himself had made. True Comics No. 8, dated January 1942, also highlights de Gaulle and his determination to fight on from exile until France was liberated from the Germans. In addition to the heads of Allied nations, a number of other real-life individuals, most of them military officers, appeared on wartime comic book covers. Virtually all of these publications were the non-fiction true story type. A rare exception to this trend was General Douglas MacArthur. Although his image did appear on various true story comic book covers, including War Heroes No. 1 and True Comics No. 11, the cover of Wiz Comics No. 31, dated June 1942, shows superhero Captain Marvel saluting America's greatest hero, MacArthur. Three years later, Alex Schomburg's cover for The Human Torch No. 18, Spring 1945, shows the Human Torch protecting MacArthur's headquarters from a horde of Japanese soldiers. Future United States President General Dwight D. Eisenhower was featured on the cover of at least five wartime comic books. General James Doolittle, leader of the 1942 air raid on Tokyo, also appeared on multiple wartime comic book covers. As did Claire Chenault, head of the famous Flying Tigers Air Squadron. And Generals George C. Marshall, Hap Arnold, George S. Patton, Mark Clark, Joseph Stilwell, and Omar Bradley, as well as naval officers such as Admiral Halsey and Admiral Nimitz. England went to war with Nazi Germany in September 1939. Public sentiment in the United States favored the British, and as a result, a considerable amount of popular culture attention was devoted to England's struggle in the pre-Pearl Harbor period, as well as afterwards. The perseverance of the people of London and elsewhere during the Blitz was one frequent motif. On the military front, the Royal Air Force and the Commandos were also the subject of films, songs, stories, and comic book covers. The use of the RAF as a surrogate for American participation in the war may be seen in films like A Yank in the RAF and Eagle Squadron. Comic book covers in 1940 and 1941 were filled with aircraft bearing the blue, white, and red roundel insignia. For example, 12 of the first 13 issues of Wings Comics, published between September 1940 and September 1941, featured RAF airplanes on their covers. There's no need to take cover when you hear these engines sound. British planes are in the sky, ways on their daily vigil bow. We'll make one of their number. Write our name upon the wing When the planes are flying over You will hear all Britain sing A number of other wartime comic books also had RAF aircraft on their covers including two different publications entitled Spitfire Comics after the famous British fighter plane. The British Navy was not overlooked. At least four issues of Marvel Mystery Comics between March and December 1941 showed the Submariner coming to the aid of British warships. However, after the RAF, the British Commandos were the group that most captured the interest of the American audience. 
In addition to several feature films about the British Raiders, a number of comic book covers highlighted their activities. The word commando later became a more generic term and was appropriated for non-British groups such as the Boy Commandos and the Commando Cubs. Lord Lewis Mountbatten was depicted on the cover of Doc Savage Comics, Volume 1, Number 10, November 1942. He is identified as Chief of the Commandos, although his name is spelled incorrectly. In addition to Lord Mountbatten, other British military figures who appeared on wartime comic book covers included General Wavell and Field Marshal Montgomery. Great Britain was not the only part of the British Empire featured on comic book covers. Canada's and Australia's contributions to the war effort were also highlighted, albeit primarily in the non-fiction or true story comic genre. Although Joseph Stalin was the face of the Soviet Union in much Allied propaganda, a handful of other Russians, fictional and real, also appeared in films, on posters, and on comic book covers. Soviet military leader Semyon Timoshenko jokingly referred to in the animated cartoon Russian Rhapsody as that Irish General Tim Oshenko, appeared on the covers of several wartime comic books. Pioneer Picture Stories No. 8 refers to him rather misleadingly as Russia's George Washington, a description which probably would have upset Joseph Stalin had he heard of it. True Picture Magazine No. 10 dubs Tim Oshenko the Blitzbuster. Famous Russian sniper Ludmila Pavlichenko is featured on the cover of War Heroes Comics No. 3. America was fascinated by the idea of a woman warrior who had allegedly killed over 300 Nazi soldiers. She toured the United States during the war and was even impersonated in a Hollywood film. Marshal Nikolai Voronov, head of the Soviet artillery forces, appears on the cover of Real Life Comics No. 21. The Russian Ace of Aces, Alexander Pokrishin, was depicted on True Comics No. 45 and on the cover of It Really Happened No. 4. Unidentified or fictional Russians are featured on several wartime comic book covers. Captain America No. 27, dated June 1943, shows Captain America and Bucky leading the Russian tank corps on their way to Berlin, about two years before Soviet troops actually did enter the German capital. Russian partisans can be seen attacking Nazis on the cover of It Really Happened No. 1, a 1944 comic, and a Russian unit is depicted on the cover of Real Heroes Comics No. 12 in the story Honor of the Regiment. Although France was occupied by the Nazis for much of the war, the French resistance and the free French government in exile were very visible in propaganda and pop culture. The cover of Captain America No. 29 shows Captain America and Bucky confronting a Nazi firing squad, which is preparing to execute members of the Free French Underground. Their propaganda posters and documents, oddly enough written in English, include shortwave reports, references to sabotage, America is with us, Roosevelt and Churchill, and the ubiquitous V for victory. This cover, unlike some other wartime comic book covers, depicts resistance to the Nazis rather than showing citizens of occupied countries as mere victims. It Really Happened Comics No. 3 features a cover story on the Maid of the Marguerites, apparently a reference to the real-life Maquis French resistance guerrillas. 
the cover of Star Spangled Comics number 33, dated June 1944, depicts the Newsboy Legion working at a servicemen's canteen. Among the patrons of the establishment is an apparent French sailor, distinguished by his stereotypical beret with a pompon on top. In addition to Charles de Gaulle, real-life French heroes appeared on the covers of some wartime comics. Real Life Comics number 15 and True Comics number 24 both feature General Henri Giraud. True Comics number 42 has a cover feature on free French General Jacques Leclerc, the hero of Paris. Depictions of China and the Chinese people were frequent in wartime propaganda. China had been fighting the Japanese since the 1930s and this gave them anti-fascist credibility and made them sympathetic figures. From its outset in 1934, the long-running newspaper comic strip Terry and the Pirates was set in war-torn China, but the foreign invaders were not identified as Japanese until after Pearl Harbor. Reprints of the comic strip appeared in comic books during the war, such as these issues of popular comics, which show Americans Terry Lee and Pat Ryan with their Chinese friends, including Connie and the gigantic Big Stoop. In addition to Chiang Kai-shek, at least one other real-life Chinese citizen appeared on the cover of a wartime comic book, female guerrilla leader Mama Mosquito on the cover of True Comics number 17. A fictional Chinese female gorilla can be seen on Alex Schomburg's cover for Marvel Mystery Comics number 55, dated May 1944. This cover alludes to the Japanese execution of downed American flyers, as well as the execution of any Chinese citizen who attempted to assist them. Apparent members of the Chinese military are also in peril on the Schomburg drawn cover of Daring Comics No. 9, Fall 1944. Their Japanese captors are dangling them over a pool of sharks, but the Human Torch, Toro, and the Submariner appear just in the nick of time. One of the most prominent Chinese characters in wartime comic books was Chop Chop, the comic relief member of the Black Hawks Squadron. Although portrayed in a stereotyped and humorous manner, Chop Chop was depicted as a brave and competent member of the group. Another recurring Chinese character on wartime comic book covers was Chinese refugee Yu Hu, another sympathetic but stereotyped comic relief character, who appeared in the Sparky Watts stories in Big Shot Comics. There was even a Chinese superhero in wartime comics. In 1944 and 1945, Blazing Comics featured the adventures of the Green Turtle, who fought the Japanese occupation of China. Created by a Chinese-American artist named Chu Hing, the Green Turtle was intended to be a Chinese character, but apparently the publisher didn't agree. The Green Turtle was always masked, and even his masked face was rarely shown and his skin was colored as if he were a Caucasian character. Other allied nations received attention in wartime propaganda, although their appearances on comic book covers were rare. Yugoslav partisan leader Draza Mihaljevic was featured on the cover of both Real Heroes No. 6, billed as Chief of the Chetniks, and Real Life Comics No. 8. The Chetniks were also featured in several wartime films. The King of the Gorillas appears on the cover of Real Heroes Comics No. 11. Although the cover doesn't identify him by name, the interior story is about Greek General Manoli Bendakis, commander of the anti-fascist partisans on the island of Crete. A rather stereotypical Dutch woman, complete with wooden shoes, is rescued from the Nazi occupiers of her country on the cover of Captain America No. 34. Among the various members of the multinational Blackhawks are representatives of various allied nations including Stanislaus Apol, Hendrickson, usually portrayed as Dutch, the Frenchman André, Chinese Chop Chop, Olaf, a representative of neutral Sweden, and American Chuck. 
Wartime popular culture and propaganda reinforced the idea that the Allies were a group of nations united against the fascist enemy, and that each contributed to the best of its ability towards the defeat of the Nazis, Italian fascists, and the Japanese. Comic books participated in this campaign, although ever mindful of the commercial necessities of their industry, which required that comic book covers, above all else, be designed to sell the magazine. Within these parameters, however, comic books did their part to promote the United Nations war effort. Thank you.